repeatedly discussed concerns around campaign financing and the fact that money has totally corrupted the political process, uh, both here in Maine and at the national level. I think uh, everybody would probably readily admit it's it's certainly worse at the national level, uh, but there's uh, plenty of concern uh, creeping down to the state level now, as we've seen races for, well, even for state Senate seats here in the state of Maine, uh, see spending, you know, a single state Senate race in uh, in Bangor here a, a couple of cycles ago, costing something like $650,000 in uh, expenses. It's just absurd, the amount of money that's being spent. Anybody who follows the process should recognize that money is a hugely corrupting influence. There is an effort underway to eliminate one of the biggest campaign finance loopholes, if you will, and it's related to so-called leadership PACs. On the telephone right now, State Representative Justin Chinette from Saco. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Don. I appreciate you being here. Um, can you can you explain to me a little bit about exactly what a leadership PAC is? We're talking, of course, PAC is the, uh, the uh, acronym for a uh, political action committee, but what is it about leadership PACs that are so onerous? So there's actually nothing in statute that articulates a leadership PAC. It's just a commonly used phrase that we use in Augusta, and it sort of permeated out to everybody. But essentially, it's, it's used to describe a political action committee that a legislator sets up, um, so or a declared legislative candidate. So these are the ones that we're trying to zero in on because, again, what what you mentioned in the kind of the toss up is 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 the word corrupt. Should legislators, sitting legislators, uh, and even those that are seeking the office, be influenced, unduly influenced by special interests and lobbyists, rather than just focusing on representing their constituents back home in their districts? And that's what we're trying to fix. So these uh, these these. Uh packs that we're talking about here, the so-called leadership packs, uh, it kind of gets that tag, leadership pack, because why? Because it's usually members of legislative leadership who are who are engaging in this practice? Right. So primarily it's used um, between legislators that want to actually obtain some leadership role, Speaker of the House, President of the Senate, but it's not necessarily just meant for that purpose. What they use the money for is to basically spread it around to different races, help other candidates within their party. But the big kicker that gets overlooked consistently is the fact that you can actually indirectly spend that money on your race. Now, legally, you cannot directly use your PAC money for your own campaign committee. But what ends up happening consistently is you'll raise, you know, a lot of thousands and thousands of dollars through your leadership PAC. You donate that money to either your uh, party caucus or actually the, you know, main Democratic Party or the Republican Party, uh -huh. and they will then spend that money in, 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 in way of called independent expenditures. So everybody, you know, listening at home is probably like, okay, that means all those mailers I get, get in the mail or all of the TV ads you're seeing, especially that have either a negative connotation or kind of propping up a particular candidate. So that's an indirect way of using all, funneling all of that dirty money, dark money, back into your own race. And, it, and it's a big loophole that we have to fix. We're speaking with State Representative Justin Chinette of Saco. Um, did, I, did I hear you correctly in that, these uh, so-called leadership packs are often aimed at uh, essentially the the voting process to determine legislative leadership. I mean, those are those are elections that uh, only members of the legislature can participate in. I mean, what sort of money would you need for that type of literal uh, in-house campaign? Well, to me, leadership isn't about raising money. It's about your ideas and what you want to bring to the table. But sadly, for some reason, we've allowed this system to take place internally in Augusta at the State House. that somehow if you raise a lot of money for your party caucus uh, and through your PAC, 
somehow that gives you some gold sticker at the end of the day going into these leadership races for the majority leader, the minority leader, Speaker of the House, President of the Senate. And, and, and again, that doesn't influence me because I want to hear what you actually want to do for our state. Right. But for some reason, they think it's a requirement to cozy up to special interest groups and say, hey, look at how much money I raised. In fact, they even say that on the House floor when they give speeches before the legislature. Now, this is all, of course, happening behind the scenes, but it's just, it really highlights to me the cancer that's eroding away our democracy internally in our state house that we have to shore up, and we can do it. There's a number of proposals that are on the table this session that will aim to tackle different aspects of this issue. Now, uh, you mentioned uh, several different proposals, uh, one of which is the uh, the bill that you have uh, testified in support of, right? That's LD-204. It's entitled, and i got to ask you, uh, who in the world came up with this name? Uh, an <laughs> act to prohibit certain activities by Maine Queen Election Act candidates before the Joint Standing Committee on Veterans and Legal Affairs. I guess that last okay. portion is just the, uh, that's not part of the title. I just kind of threw that in there because it sounds like a mouthful. It, it, it does. Well, luckily, I don't have any say in the bill title, <laughs> so don't blame me. Um, okay. But uh, So the LD-204 is actually Representative Anne-Marie Mastracchio's uh, bill of Stanford. Yes. Uh, it's a bill I'm co-sponsoring, and it's a bill that is basically my version that I put in last session that we could only muster about 56 votes in the House. But essentially, this closes or would close the loophole in the clean election system. We have to make the clean election system more clean because right now there are blanket um, backdoor loopholes that allow individuals to create an entire network of what I call completely legal bribery. And what I mean by that is you're taking taxpayer money to fund your campaign, which I totally support, by the way. I think there's, there's an inherent value in making sure that you don't have to have big bucks to run for office. And guess what? Maine voters agree. So the system is effective on paper, but what we have to do is say you should not be allowed to funnel all the special interest money and fundraise all that money into your own pack while at the same time professing to the voting public, hey, look at me, I'm clean. I'm not influenced by special interest. I'm not taking that money. But in fact, they are behind the scenes. And it's publicly accessible, but unless you really know what you're looking for, it's hard to track it. I see. Now, um, uh, you mentioned that there are a number of uh, different efforts underway during this uh, current legislative session. I noticed that uh, that this uh, particular bill that you've just spoken of is one that has uh, garnered support from the editorial board of the Portland Press Herald based on their uh, uh, op-ed that was uh, posted just yesterday. The title, Leadership Packs Create Loophole in Main Races, and they refer to the bill that you are supporting as the best bill of the bunch. That's got to be uh, somewhat encouraging, but... Uh, certainly uh, the support of the editorial board of a newspaper and getting broad support within the main legislature are two entirely different things. Entirely different things. And I will mention, too, what the Portland Press-Herald uh, mentioned was actually one of the other proposals, and this is my bill that's actually been put forward, that would actually ban all leadership tax for either a declared candidate, whether you're clean or traditional, and for sitting legislators. So why they why they supported that particular proposal is it, it doesn't pick on clean election candidates. It, it's it's an all out um, ban on on these tax because to me, at least traditionally financed candidates, there's a cap, right? So with, with between clean election candidates and traditionally financed candidates, there is a limit on the amount of money being infused in that race. But the problem with tax is it's an unlimited amount of money, as stated by Citizens United. And so the problem is what we can do with, with my proposal that kind of takes it a step further from the one we were just talking about is saying, okay, let's make it an even playing field on both sides. You can run your campaign committee. If you're a traditionally financed candidate, you can fundraise with the, with the cap at $375 per donation. You can become a clean election candidate and take public dollars for your campaign. And guess what? My colleagues could still fundraise for their party caucus. They could still fundraise for their party with this law going into place. So, so their concerns about, oh, gosh, this will, this will limit our, our ability to fundraise, this just says you should not, as a legislator or one seeking that office, 
not directly take money from the very special interests and lobbyists we're supposed to be regulating. You know, what really bothers me, Don, is to see chairs of certain legislative committees directly taking money from the very industries they're supposed to be regulating. So you'll see chairs that oversee a particular committee of oversight, so a particular subject matter. Can you give me and, a specific example, Justin? So, for instance, AT&T, uh, Time Warner Cable, these are big multinational corporations that will directly deposit money into PACs, and it just so happens that it might be the chair of the Energy Committee, or it might be in leadership, and, it, and, it's, and it's used to try to gain access, gain favor, uh, on a particular public policy point. So while somebody listening at home may not have that direct influence over a legislator, they could send an email, they can make a phone call, but they're not writing a $1,000 check to a PAC. What do you think speaks louder for, for some people? What do you think creates a bad perception of our government? It, it's that $1,000 check. <laughs> Why do we need to create that system? Why can't we put a stop to it? So we're speaking with State Representative Justin Chunette about uh, money and politics. Uh, you know, interesting that you, uh, that you mentioned as an example companies like AT&T and Time Warner. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time on this radio program talking about the importance of expanded uh, broadband capability in our state and what that means uh, specifically with uh, economic development in mind. And I'm not talking about, uh, you know, a... Uh, uh, a broader availability of a service like uh, DSL uh, Internet from uh, a company like Fairpoint. I'm talking about something like fiber optic cable and public-private partnerships the likes of which we have seen in the town of Rockport, which are able to provide uh, just uh, incredible access uh, to the Internet. And uh, it's the sort of thing that would lead companies to actually choose to locate here in the state of Maine all other items not even being equal. If they can come here and get that sort of uh, connectivity, they will. And we've seen just recently uh, Time Warner Cable, for example, hosting an event uh, that they uh, invited lawmakers to, uh, had uh, actually paid for the lawmakers' uh, lodging and meals while they were there at a, uh, at a very nice location in Cape Elizabeth to explain to them why public-private partnerships were such a horrible idea. Uh, that's just uh, yet another example of money getting into this process and really, really big money in the private sector uh, working to, well, to gain the best government money can buy for them. This issue with uh, with PACs certainly seems like more of the same. And I, I, I agree with you that lawmakers shouldn't be saying on the one hand, hey, I'm a clean elections candidate. Look at me. I'm so much better than those people who are taking that nasty, dirty money. And then they're running one of these so-called leadership packs at the same time. Uh, right. That- it's, it's hypocritical. Yeah, exactly. And, and it gets to your point about, you know, the, the special dinners and everything else like that. We have to, to set a prime example for our entire state to say your government cannot and will not be bought to the highest bidder, to the special interest group or lobbyists with the, with the biggest checkbook. And that is exactly what is taking place today. Uh, and, and, and it's not to say that the, the dinners and all those other things are not something that we need to be taking a look at, but the real money are through these packs. Sure. That's where the greatest influence is taking place, where the un, literally unlimited amounts of money, and, and it will directly have an impact around people's dinner table because this affects public policy decision-making. When they're getting these thousands of dollars they're, uh, from these interest groups, you know, it, it's hard to say whether or not they're going to be unduly influenced. The perception is there. And as you know, Don, perception is everything in politics. And, and we need our legislators to be truthful, honest, and, up, uh, you know, uh, forward about, about the issues that we face and about actually representing the people back home in our communities and not be tied down to feeling that pressure from those groups. Let's get rid of that. Let's make the system more clean. I think it's a common sense thing. It's things that it's people, people back home support this. So let's, let's call our legislators. Let's get uh, not just LD204 passed, but let's get LD619 passed, which is a broad stroke uh, over all, a ban over, over all these tax, and, and let's get this accomplished this session. We can do it if we all work together to make it happen. Well, you know, it, the, the money is coming from such a uh, from such a narrow band here. Um, 
referencing that uh, op-ed from the Press Herald, uh, they specifically mentioned research done uh, a couple of years, excuse me, a couple of years ago by the uh, organization known as Maine Citizens for Clean Elections. Uh, that's an organization that we've had join us on the program on a number of occasions. They've currently got a, a petition effort underway. Um, they found in their research that uh, 152 donors responsible for 73% of donations to PACs in Maine. That's that's just an unbelievable notion to me that you've got uh, these 152 uh, donors, either individuals or uh, corporate interests, who have accounted for three quarters of the money being donated to political action committees here in the state of Maine. I, I don't know how anybody can look at that and think that it passes the straight face, face test with regard to the potential for truly undue influence. Right, and, and, I, and I will mention uh, Maine Citizens for Clean Elections is supporting uh, my bill. And uh, one of the things they, they mentioned as well is that seven of the, the, the current uh, legislative leaders raised more than $400,000 just in the last uh, election cycle, <laughs> where we saw really one of the major problems with money specifically in Maine, where it was just poured in like you saw it in Bangor, you saw it in, in Scarborough, you saw it in a lot of different places, uh, you know, much more significantly than others. But that's just ridiculous that we even have to be having this conversation. Is, is this acceptable? Um, and so Maine Citizens for Clean Elections obviously has provided a great leadership role in this issue. Yes. And this, in this November, there will be a ballot initiative, though I will say I do have concerns over just pouring more money into the system. I agree that Maine, that Maine Clean Election candidates – uh, probably need more resources in order to compete. I've been a clean election candidate before. I've been a traditionally financed candidate before. I've seen both sides of it. Uh, the problem is if we don't fix this PAC issue, it's not really solving any issue. It's like a surface issue. Mm -hmm. Because what ends up happening is, yeah, you give mean clean election candidates more money, but then they can still turn around and raise unlimited amounts to these PACs. So, so to me, it's not addressing the root problem. You fix the root problem, and then let's have a conversation about upping the ante uh, for the clean election candidate. Uh, and at that point, I think it would be acceptable. But until we fix this PAC issue, I have some major concerns about just moving forward with pouring more money into a system that's already – the flood of money is already there. So I, I, that's my major concern uh, moving forward with the ballot initiative until we pass this PAC reform. And I think we have a good shot at it this time, but it has consistently been very difficult to get my colleagues uh, on the, both the Democratic side and the Republican side. It's like whatever party is in power, they never want to talk about PAC and campaign finance reform, even though this is a Democratic principle. This is in the Democratic Party platform that we fight to get money out of politics. And yet when Democrats are elected, somehow their brain shuts off from Democratic values, and we are just like, oh, no, we have to play the game now. That is not acceptable, and we have to hold Democrats and Republicans accountable. So when they give speeches in the campaign about we've got to get money out of politics, and then they turn around and vote against things like this measure, against PAC and campaign finance reform, we have to call them out for it. Uh, I'm guessing that uh, calling out legislative leadership like this hasn't exactly, uh, you know, gotten you uh, uh, cards and flowers and candies from people. <laughs> Uh, Representative Diane Russell gave me a Valentine card. I don't know if that counts. Um, but I, but I will say no. I mean, it, it, it's difficult. Uh, it's not a popular position to take, and especially as somebody who's a young legislator. You know, I, I arrived at the state house at 21 years old, and and I'm, I'm I'm fairly new. I'm in my second term. It is not a popular issue to take on so early. Um, and you know, but I think it's right. And I think that at some point. We actually have to step up and say, if we all sat on our hands and said, well, gosh, we can't tackle that issue, we're going to be pressured, or we have to play the game, you know, is it really – does it really matter whether or not you're, you're Speaker of the House or President of the Senate or you have you curry favor with people internally? This is about representing the people back home in your districts who put you in these positions. This is about making our state better. So what if you have to ruffle a few feathers to actually get something accomplished on behalf of those people? I mean, why are you even there? I mean, so that's why I think my colleagues need to recognize that that is their job. Their job is representing the people and not special interest groups. And it's a high time that we say that legislators will not and cannot be bought. i got to tell you, nobody would be happier than I if we could get to such uh, a point in time where uh, people such as yourself 
who are uh, really uh, trying to move these very important initiatives forward uh, no longer ran into comments coming from uh, seated lawmakers, things like, oh, yeah, well, he's the, he's the new guy. He'll figure it out eventually. Or, yeah, he's, a, he's an ideologue, but he'll come around. That's where the real problem is. And I also think that another problem here is the, uh, is the breakdown as far as coverage is concerned about topics like this within the media. This is the sort of stuff that ought to be uh, the front page headlines instead of being inundated with, uh, well, what I would call uh, just utter crap. Things like, uh, you know, what color is the dress on Facebook? or uh, whether or not uh, there will be a death penalty in the Jody Arias murder trial. Uh, These are events that affect, uh, well, virtually no one, and yet Mm. they are the ones that are consistently uh, top-of-the-fold news, uh, top-of-the-webpage news. And issues like this, where we're seeing our futures uh, essentially sold down the river for campaign contributions, uh, seem to get very little coverage indeed. And what's, and what's frustrating is, and it's not to take away the fact that, you know, legislators haven't put in really bad bills, but it's like when I hear on the news the coverage about the state dog, for instance, and, <laughs> and, 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 and you know, sort of, um, you know, thinking back at the state, you know, dessert. Or yeah, the state, hey, you uh, know, take, that, take that dog for a walk while I'm stuffing my face with a whoopie pie and washing it down with moxie and, and knowing that I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm really doing the state a favor by uh, – by engaging in those three things. It's, it's, right. I agree. Patently absurd. Right. It, it, it is absurd, and, it, and I don't take away the fact that legislators have a responsibility to put in, in good bills, but I would say the media could focus on the real issues. I mean, we're dealing with over 1,700 bills. There's bound to be bills that are kind of silly or maybe they're constituent specific. So maybe if a constituent comes before a legislator and says, can you put this bill in? I really want it. I usually feel like we put it in because that's our job, you know, and so sometimes it's a little silly. However, the media could recognize what that is and and, and, and say, you know what, let's focus on the things that are substantive, that are based on on real issues that are affecting people and affecting our entire government, like tax and campaign finance reform. But it, it, it does seem like that's a hard sell because it's not an easy topic. Unless you're sort of following politics on a consistent basis, it can seem very in the weeds. It can kind of seem like distant. Does this really impact my life? Does this really impact my job? And and, and, and the problem is it, it really does because this directly impacts any decision that we make on those 1,700 bills, on the big budget that we're dealing with from the governor, because each piece has some special interest group. Each piece has a, a, an army of lobbyists that line the halls wanting to curry favor and, and get our support for something or to, to not vote for something. Meanwhile, people are at home working really hard, trying to make a living, you know, um, and, and, and everything else. And so they may not be able to, to, to essentially lobby their own legislator because you would think your own legislator is going to represent your voice not the voice of some group that just paid you a check for a thousand bucks uh, or an unlimited amount of money. And so we have an opportunity to fix that. And I hope Democrats and Republicans can come together on something that to me is pretty common sense. State Representative Justin Chinette in favor of LD 204 to enact to prohibit certain activities by Maine Clean Election Act candidates. We appreciate your work in this endeavor and uh, wish you the best moving forward through this session. We'll look to speak with you again, sir. Thank you so much, Don.